welcome to episode 27 of That 60s Recording Podcast, the podcast that has conversations inspired by the golden era of recording. My name is Joe Montague uh, from All You Need Is Drums and I am your host. 27 means that this is over a year I've been doing this podcast now. I had no expectations when I started it, but the fact that I'm still sat here doing it a year later is uh, fantastic, and I'm absolutely loving it. I hope <laughs> I hope you are too. Um, and with that in mind, I hope that you enjoyed the first episode of my conversation with Ben Pike. And um, this is the episode where we really start to dig in to his gear and the mastering process. I found it really interesting and I really relish the opportunity to pick somebody's brains <laughs> about the mastering process. Uh, I know that a few of you have already been in touch with Ben about getting your songs mastered and that fills me with joy. <laughs> I love the fact that uh, we can support people, uh, the people that I'm interviewing. Um, I just feel like there's a really lovely community building around this sort of uh, 60s -y style ideas and, and music making. Um, so thank you to those and I uh, have every confidence that Ben will blow you away with how amazing uh, he makes your music sound. I mean, sure it sounds amazing already, but there we go. Okay, we're gonna dive right in. Here is uh, the second part of my conversation with Ben Pike from Rare Tone Mastering. suppose we should talk about the gear that you've got in your studio <laughs> yeah i mean I, yeah yeah um sure but I'm, I'm happy to do that i'm not sure yeah how nerd how nerdy you want to get and how uh oh uh, go go full full nerd I, you yeah. know, I, I want to know all of it so obviously there is two choice pieces of gear that you've got that are gonna um that sort of um make me look up and um yeah. so they're very, um, I'll let you describe them. So do you want to just talk through, uh, you know, we'll get into those, but do you want to just sort of, sort of give an overview of, of what you've got? So you're sat, um, you know, I've seen pictures of your studio and, and you're, you've got a, a standard sort of mastering setup where you've got the slightly angled desk and all your outboards in front of you um, so that you can sort of tweak yeah. as you go. Um, and then what, what have you got that you're using um, there and, and sort of, could you talk through your setup? Yeah, sure. So, um, so everything comes comes into the computer. So I'm not completely analog. I'm not going straight from tape. Um, so as people send me the files, I go onto the computer. Then my um, converters or sound card is a Lynx Helo, um, which is pr pretty common for mastering studios. Um, it's just a really great interface. Um, great to to be able to send your music out into your outboard and recapture it and back into the computer so lynx um, has got uh i mean i've i've looked into lynx aurora at times yeah. i don't i don't know the different levels of model but um they seem to have a pretty solid reputation and for conversion among studios yeah they're, they're pretty they're up there there's there's pretty much the the, the links, uh, there's this one, which is great for mastering. There's a, they do a couple more, which have more channels, but I just need a stereo output and input really for what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, they're up there. Um, so, so everything comes out of the, my converters into um, my mastering router, which is a dangerous liaison. So that's basically, um, a bit like a fan it's like a fancy patch bay so all, all my outboard gear is connected to that uh, and i can just press press buttons to bring it in or out and oh, change cool. the order um and use some of the bits in parallel processing as well um so i can really quickly put an eq in turn it and turn it on or off to sort of you know hear what the before and after that's cool. So it's almost, uh, it's it's sort of, you've got the quickness of, of plugins, if you like, but on outboard gear. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I can literally have six or seven bits of gear going 
uh, and then just click all of them in or out or swap the order and stuff like really super quick, which is Amazing. great. Literally, yeah, at, at the touch of a button, and which is yeah really important for making decisions because you, yeah, or audio uh, uh, or auditory memory is really short. So when when we're listening to stuff, if there's too long a pause, I think it's about four seconds. Ah. Too long a pause between listening to one thing and then listening to the other one, you'll forget and you won't be able to compare it very well. That's so interesting. Uh, I yeah. remember um, again just going go, going back to the conversation I had with Ken Scott talking about mixing sort of on the fly. Um, that's so. You know, I, I do a bit of rudimentary mixing work, and that's something that's talked about a lot in mixing is is sort of impulse decisions and um you know obviously there's a the fixing stage of mixing where you sort of make everything sound how it needs to and then just making snap decisions based on what you're hearing in that moment mm. and um yeah i had no idea about um what did you call it auditory memory i, I like that yeah. i think there might, there might be a, another uh word for that as well and maybe a slightly more scientific one but yeah what, what you're hearing basically you, you don't you don't hang on to it for very long amazing um, that's uh, I, I yeah i just didn't know it that's really cool and it makes sense in terms of um you know having everything in front of you like you do and, and it, so it sort of shows the importance of um having a setup that can facilitate that um mm. you know something i i routinely talk about with with people who ask me advice is um having a setup where i don't have to make decisions that take me a long time to to, to sort of sort out yeah all my percussion is there any snare drum that i want to use is there symbols that i want to change out are there you know every option available to me is literally within an arm's reach of my drum stool so you know when i'm making decisions on a track for percussion and drums it just happens and yeah, uh, right. sort of. You've put, you've put a scientific name to it. I can't, I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll do, I'll try and uh, dig out some uh, a couple of uh, papers on it or whatever, and send send it over. Um, but yeah, it's basically if I listen to a bit of a track, if then if I had to stop, get some wire, get some cables, plug in a compressor, turn it on, dial it in, and then press play again. By the time I've done that, I I wouldn't my memory my auditory memory wouldn't be good enough to actually compare the two so, yeah yeah it's really yeah really important that we can do this all really quick um yeah so i guess that's really like yeah it's super important part of the uh of, of the studio it's uh it's a question you see all the time on sort of audio forums and stuff like what i want to start mastering what what gear should i get you know and it's a bit of a bit of a difficult one because you need a few few pieces really before you can start using the outboards uh, efficiently yeah it's it's i mean it seems to always be the case it's a, in a sense it's a boring piece of gear to have but yeah incredibly important yeah um, yeah you know we all want you know I, i'd love a uh you know a huge rack of you know i've got i've got a couple but a huge rack yeah. of 10, 1073s or valve pre's or whatever but the fact of yeah. the matter is i need a good interface to start with because if i have i have all of those things going through a terrible interface there's no point so you know you got to yeah. you got to build from the ground up don't you <laughs> yeah it's true and one of the most common things that comes up uh, like i'm a member in a few mastering sort of uh, facebook groups and and different forums and stuff and uh, yeah, it's the bore, really boring stuff that's the most important, like sound, you know, sound acoustic treatment. You know, no one wants to go and spend six hundred quid on a on an acoustic panel. <laughs> you know, people want a, a a piece of gear in front of them where they can, you know, play with the dials and stuff. Is it, I mean, again, it's interesting that you're saying that. I mean, going back to uh, the conversation with with Malcolm Toft, who you know famously made the Trident desks. Yeah, that's his uh, piece of advice. You know, oh, right. what, you know, uh, what's your piece of advice for for young people coming up? Acoustic treatment. Make sure your room is treated. Um, yeah. you know, that's why I was asking you about it at the beginning because I know it's such an important part. And yeah. it's um, 
it, it's it's those little things that are it's the, they're the boring answers to the questions but you know you want to everybody wants to buy a pair of headphones that sound like um you know some studio in la yeah. <laughs> or a yeah, plug in you know have you seen those plugins that do that that you know emulate stu- uh, mixing rooms in studios yeah i've seen that yeah and it's I mean, that's cool. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. That's extremely cool. But if just make sure that your room sounds nice yeah. <laughs> when you're doing it. <laughs> yeah. Or send yeah. it to somebody who has got a nice sounding room. You know, that's the... Yeah. And it's, um, you know, we all just want to buy... Everybody wants a quick fixes and, and cool stuff. And it's yeah. just, oh, unfortunately, yeah. it's not the cool stuff to spend all your money on. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's a shame, but, you know, it is. So following on from that... Um, yeah. Do you have your gear racked out in a particular order? Um, yeah, I've sort of I've got it set up um, really for how it works best visually for me. So I have my two um, EQs of right in front of me on the desk because uh, they they've got the most sort of detailed um, information that I need to look at. So all the EQ points and how much I'm boosting or cutting by. So so everything's sort of set set up. Um, yeah. So so it's 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 quick the quickest and easiest way for me to use it, I guess. Yeah. So there's a couple of bits where that I don't use as often, but I might have to stand up and look over to just fine tune the dials and stuff. So uh, yeah, the ones I, I use least are, are further away from me. And um, what would they be? Um, so I guess one of them is the unfair child compressor. Not not that I use it the least, but it's the biggest. It's an eight, yeah. eight, unit, eight rack units, which is pretty huge. Um, uh, but all the dials and stuff are really big and I can see them uh, fine. Yeah. Where, where it is um, and then the the other one is a um, uh, an, a different EQ a third EQ that I use mainly for mid-side processing okay uh, so it's a bit more subtle in its use um, and because um, it's got wider EQ curves to it um, there's not as much detail on the actual unit so i can see the settings fine but but the, my two main eqs i've got loads of information so i'm sat directly over them okay so let, let's talk about them so what what are those yeah. two eqs so the i guess the first one and, and probably your favorite would be <laughs> the, uh, the chandler curve bender yes so ding, this ding, is ding. the one from the yeah, all the fireworks so are going off. It's, I feel like we've been. I've, yeah. I've been. I've knew knew this was coming. <laughs> I'm just excited to talk about it. Yeah, have to get some uh, sound effects lined up for. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so this is the EQ from the original uh, Abbey Roads uh, desk, the TG one two three four five, uh, which is the the famous desk at Abbey Road that the Beatles recorded a lot on yes um dark side of the moon was done on like some massive iconic albums so and this is just the eq section of that desk so i was doing a bit of reading about it and it seems that about 10 ish years ago is when chandler decided to reissue it and um am i right in thinking that some of the eq points are they they've put more points in now so there's is there sort of 50 different points that you can get or something um that's just a bit more varied than the, the in the original version although the back end of it all is the same um you can just get a bit yeah. more out of it now yeah definitely so so the original um eq on the desk had three dials like you might see on on a lot of um mixing desks with a bass middle and treble um so the bass was literally had one setting that was just called bass and that was, <laughs> and you could turn it up or down. Um, so there's now, <laughs> so there's now seven settings on okay. the bass section here. So they've added six more. So uh, yeah, it's a bit more usable for, um, for that. And then, and then the middle section has been split into a low mid and a high mid. 
uh, and they've added loads more EQ points. And then, yeah, again, I think the high, I think the high one on the original desk was just one setting of 10 kilohertz that you could turn up or down. Okay. And that's got seven or eight on there. So. It's interesting how restricted it all was back then. I, I love yeah. the fact that, you know, bass up or down. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's kind of it. <laughs> yeah. Why, um, what, what interested you in, in buying, I mean, you mentioned already the, um, the sort of unfair child that you've got as well. Um, yeah. But like, have you got a particular interest in, in, uh, I mean, it's, it doesn't need to necessarily be Beatles related, but there's definitely a sound that those two, um, those two units in particular have, and and a, sort of an image they conjure up uh, in your in you know in your mind's eye. What was your inspiration between those in buying those two? Yeah, just um, I guess just that they're, they're both like legendary pieces. The the fair the original Fairchild and 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 the desk that have been used on so many albums from the 60s or even onwards i think i think this the curve bender eq now um is, is used it, they used it on beyonce's lemonade and stuff like that there's loads of modern albums that are still wow. using this wow uh, so it, and because it sounds great and there's a reason it's lasted for decades <laughs> you know it sounds really good um same same with the Fairchild. It's uh, yeah, they they have a sound and and it's consistently worked from from you know Beatles stuff to to modern modern uh, modern stuff. And, yeah. Do you think that sound wise they are are trying to sort of decipher what it is what it is about that that sort of era of gear that. Um, that is right. I mean, obviously the the sort of Fairchild, the Beatles absolutely rinsed it. You know, particularly yeah. on drums. You know, the, yeah. one of the things that um, the Beatles are, are known for in terms of mixing is just cranking things. Um, yeah. And clearly, you're not quite going to be quite as heavy handed with it. But yeah. the fact that they're such colourful pieces of gear must. Um, must be part of the reason that they've stood the test of time. Like they're confidently unique as what they are. Um, yeah. You know that a lot of modern, you know, say like a surgical EQ or you know some sort of um, parametric EQ is not going to have the same richness to the sound quality of it um, that gear in the sixties had through necessity or just because yeah. that's what the technology was available. You know, it yeah. wasn't by choice back then. It was just that like, that's what that's just what it was. Yeah, and yeah, part of it was yeah, like you say, was an, a happy accident. The, some some of the gear added noise to to the signal, uh, but it turned out that was a really nice type of noise. <laughs> this harmonic saturation that that um, like thickened the signal in in a nice way, uh, and there was lots of gear that, that did it in a not very nice way. And obviously that that gear hasn't stood the test of time, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, yeah, I've totally forgotten your question about that. No, it's um, fine. But... I just love the idea. I love the idea that modern records are using uh, gear that began life in in the sixties. Essentially, you yeah. know, this I can't find. You know, that's just such a brilliant example of why this particular era is so important in music. Um, yeah. you know, just one example you know let you know that's the recording side of things let alone the sort of the songwriting side of things and there's a, a thousand reasons we could talk about as to why it's so important but you know yeah. the, the fact that um you know beyonce record is using an eq that was made in the 60s just sort of tickles yeah. me i love it <laughs> so, sort of made especially for abbey road and and for the, that sort of era yeah yeah it's incredible um yeah. how uh are, are they Oh, could you just talk about actually your other EQ while we're here talking about EQs? Yeah, so I've got a couple more. I've got the um, a Great River uh, Stereo Mastering EQ, um, which is a, which is another one. Um, it's got a good bit of heritage going back to I think the seventies, um, 
Uh, but I mean, it's been updated now with sort of uh, clean, a bit of a cleaner signal path and stuff like that. But um, it's another one. It's a lot cleaner and a lot more transparent than than the curve bender or, and tube stuff. But it's it's got some great options where you can drive it and get a really nice nice sort of um, saturated sound. You've almost and, answered my next question. I'm interested as to how. You know, obviously, two mammoth EQs that you've got there. How do you? Um, I mean, presumably you don't think about it. It's almost instinctive. But how? Uh, what? How, how would you describe how you choose to use what and in what way? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess it's it's quite hard to put into words. I it be I'd have I'll have to do like a comparison of these one day. And, <laughs> Like run run a piece of audio through them both because they have a few EQ points that are exactly the same, um, but yeah, they both just sort of have their own sound. So I just sort of I'd use the curve bender say stuff that's um, if I'm EQing around the vocal range, that's where it's, it okay. really works beautifully. It sounds amazing, sort of boosting um, around there, and a great river I find really great on some on bass and really high end so it's got it's got like a 22k shelf uh, which can which can be a bell uh boost as well actually but so it's got really super high sort of air the sort of um yeah glistening sort of airy sound on on the top is it's really great for that so i'll quite often use the great river after something's come out of the Fairchild compressor. So as it's gone into the compressor, it's it's been sort of a bit, a tiny bit squashed and it's got some sort of valve uh, saturation and stuff like that. And then adding that really high air on top, coming out of that really sort of opens it up a bit. It's, um, I, I know it's a, it's a sort of nerdy talk, but I really enjoy yeah. hearing the, you know, I, I, I enjoy, the struggle of trying to put it into words it is yeah. it's really interesting i mean there's yeah. decisions that i make at the studio that you don't think about them especially when you're working on your own do you i mean um mm. you know both of us work on our own an awful lot and you just you've not got a, a mental uh commentary running you just make the decision don't you based on what you sort of well based on that four seconds rule that you talked about before you know yeah. you just you're just just doing things and then somebody yeah. says, why have you used the curve bender there as opposed to the Great River? And you go, well, I don't know. I just know that it's going to do the thing that I want it to do. And um, I, I don't, I, I can't really describe what that thing is, but there's something there that I just need to, I know that will do it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It's dif it is very difficult to put into words. Yeah. I guess it's a, a lot of time spent doing it as well. You just, you reach for a piece of gear and test it. If it works, that's great. If it doesn't work, you you try the next piece and, and sort of play around like that. So the more you do that, the more you're likely to pick the right gear first time. How does compression and limiting then fit into your setup? If we, We've talked a lot about EQs. Um, so yeah. you've got the Fairchild there, and then what else yeah. have you got? So, yeah, the massive Fairchild, which is great. Big valve compressor, so... And typically at the mastering stage, I don't use a lot of compression, but it stuff goes through the compressor, even if it's not actually getting compressed, because um, it still picks up the uh, those valves. I uh, I keep I keep cutting you off because it's such an interesting topic, but that's something that I do. I have um, uh, I have the Fairchild plugin, um, you know the the, yeah. the Waves one. I think they called it a Puig Child, and. Okay. Um, on my Beatles mixes, obviously, I, I smash it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but on the, when I'm mixing in general, I'll often run things through it um, just completely flat, and it um, it it's lovely, absolutely lovely. Um, particularly yeah. on vocals, I find it it sort of brings them out really nicely. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, that's part of the beauty of this this one is you can stuff through it, and it 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 has a six valves on the input stage um that, that pad pad the signal so just going into it you you get sort of old db's worth of, of valve uh, sort of 
yeah saturation loveliness <laughs> yeah yeah um but i still do use it to to for slight compression obviously depending on the material uh, but then i have another a dangerous compressor which is pretty much the exact opposite of that it's a super transparent super clean compressor um which i'll sort of use on if anything's a bit spiky or is sort of a bit too dynamic and i just want to sort of tame the peaks a little bit i might i might run it through the dangerous compressor instead um because that won't really add add anything uh to it but it can sort of just make stuff a bit just even everything out a bit a bit nicer and then then i'll go into a an, an analog limiter before it it goes back into the computer it sounds like you've thought you know you've got a really well thought through collection of gear that you've you know sort of a, a nice combination between sort of color pieces and um pieces that um are sort of clear and just do a job essentially yeah, sort of just like work tools. A couple, yeah, so I've got yeah a couple that just do something that I need them to do, and then I've got a couple that are a bit more creative, I guess. What's um, um What's missing? What's next? What's missing? There, yeah, I've there's a few things I've got my eyes on, and um, I haven't mentioned my uh, analog actually yet. My taper analog tape simulator. Which oh is, yes, uh, I read about that on your website. It sounds really interesting. Yeah. So this is it's a it's an analog piece of gear. Um, Would you mind just uh, mentioning the name again? The, the signal broke up uh, as oh, you, yeah. as you said it, and I know everyone yeah. will be going, "What did he say? What did he say?" <laughs> so it's the Anamod ATS One, uh, and they've just come back into production. Actually, they went out of production for quite a long time. Okay. So they you can buy them, although I think they might have all been snapped up straight away, but look into it if you're interested um but it, it's a it's a two unit piece of outboard gear which is uh relies on analog modeling and um, and it has card slots in it and you can buy different cards which emulate the sound of different tape machines oh. so i've got in here a studer um a80 um, and an older uh, Ampex tape machine, which I can just flip between. Amazing. Uh, and and these are well regarded within the sort of mastering community as as sounding as close as you could possibly get to to running stuff out to tape and back. That's um, incredible. In fact, people prefer using this because it's so close; it's unnoticeable and it's so much easier and quicker to use. Yeah, I mean, even the the podcast that's currently out as we are recording this is with Simon Traw at Soup Studios. And, and uh, you know, we talk about the, the pitfalls of, of outboard, uh, not outboard, of tape, um, you know, yeah. as, as gorgeous as it is. But then, you know, uh, the fact of life is that, um, as, well, particularly for what you're doing, you're not actually recording to tape. Um, but the you know yeah. the fact of the modern modern way is a lot of us don't have time to to be doing that you know we need a, something reliable um, yeah and yeah. Uh, if it, if you can get ninety nine percent of the way there with with uh, you know something like that then why not yeah yeah I mean it, it definitely works for me for mastering because I might send a project out and someone want me to then tweak it a bit I need to be able to recall every setting. So this helps me do that. Whereas if I was using a, a proper tape machine to run everything out to and back, it just wouldn't be the same every time. There's so, so many variations in humidity that affects tape, uh, how it's lined up on the heads and everything like that. So yeah, yeah. I just wouldn't be able to use it reliably enough for mastering, I don't think. Um. So... I mean, I'm I'm still just sort of in awe of that. That's it's such a, a cool, it's such a cool piece of gear. I, I kind of I want one. <laughs> yeah, and you can actually buy different. There's still a couple of other machine types I I could order off the website and slot in a different another machine so I could flip between them. That's it's pretty, um, pretty amazing. Yeah, pretty. yeah, it is. It's yeah. um sort of a nice balance between um sort of analog and and a. Uh, 
kind of the plugin world, really, because it's almost like yeah. an outboard plugin, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. sort of. Yeah, and uh, it it just seems like a nice a nice sort of bridge between them. Um, yeah, because you say it uses analog technology as opposed, you know, it's not digital modeling, is it? They've they've got as it presumably has electronics inside it that do yeah. do the lifting work. Yeah. Um. Mm. So I, I go on then. What's missing? <laughs> we we didn't get what's to what's missing. missing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's uh, yeah. There's a there's a few pieces of gear um, that are basically uh, saturation devices. So uh, yeah, I've got my uh, there's sort of three three different things that that I would. If I had if I had the money, I'd buy straight away and and slot in here. But they're all sort of the same thing in in that the units which add color rather than do a specific task of compression or EQ. Um, so, like just to add vibe or harmonic saturation, color, mojo, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what so, are they? So one is a Ker Kerwax replica, okay, uh, built by um, Kerwax as a studio in France, and the guys hand built a um, analog studio. And yeah, it's all it's an all valve uh, thing, and it's basically a, a unit that has a load of valves in it, and you okay. can drive them at different, um, yeah, sort of different different rates and stuff like that how do you spell kerwax i'm curious now oh k-e-r yeah wax w-a-x okay that's not um it's not a name i've heard before yeah oh it's, a, be it's a beautiful building it looks like a yeah yeah nice old um french manor yeah yeah that's cool so um so it's almost a like a valve sort of amplifier where you can you can choose how much saturation you're using on the on the valves yeah pretty much yeah um so yeah just you could drive something get it really thick and and sort of warm or just add a real subtle touch mm. so yeah that's something that yeah i've had my eye on for a while i'd certainly like to try out um, and then yeah there's the um one that's come out more recently, uh, which was a sort of collaboration between Hendy Amps, who make amazing gear, and um, another mastering engineer. That is called The Oven. Okay. Um, yeah, if you type in Hendy Amps The Oven, I'm sure, yeah, you'll find it. Um, I love the, all of these names that they all have are so glamorous, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. And this is yeah, this is another one that sort of is is a very similar thing, but it has a lot more options, um, and and they've chosen to name it all around sort of cooking uh, related. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at it now. That's a very cool piece of uh, piece yeah. of gear. Temperature cook, broil. I think is one. I can't. Uh, yeah, I can't see that it's sort of faded out on one side. That's incredible. Oh. Oh, yeah. sizzle! <laughs> yeah, yeah, sizzle's one of them. That's amazing. Yeah, that's funny. Oh, yeah, they've the the, um, the central dials are called the burners. Oh, yeah, that's brilliant. I sort of like the fact that it's it's a bit it's not quite as scientific as some outboard can be, and it's like, yeah, well, let's add some sizzle or let's, <laughs> let's add some burn to this track. I think that's quite cool. Yeah, that's uh, very cool. Yeah. yeah. So I think yeah. So there's 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 a few bits of re really good sort of high end gear like that that um, I'd certainly like to try out anyway. That sort of fit with my sort of my studio and the way I work, which is you know heavy on the analog gear and and adding that sort of analog signal to stuff. I really enjoy that. You could ask any um, anybody in the audio industry or just any musician in general. You know what's what's on your list, and you yeah. straight you straight away knew there's three things on my list. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. Um, everyone's got their list, haven't they? Yeah. Oh, there's there's twenty grand's worth of gear on my list. If, you know, <laughs> if I had the money, 
<laughs> that's it exactly yeah. um, so i want to talk a little bit about um your free mastering mondays that you've been offering so um clearly covid has um, affected uh, everything you know and it, the sort of remote industries um you know that i work in and, and mastering is essentially a remote industry even if you're working with local clients um have exploded and mm -hmm. they've exploded in a you know in a positive way but then also a lot of people are, are losing work um you know i i for one have you know a lot of the touring that i was doing before um yeah. it, you know it's it's um it's actually helped because now i'm you know working a lot of the studio and and i'm enjoying that um but a lot of people have lost a huge chunk of their incomes and i think your what you're offering with your free mastering mondays is is the antidote to that it's um you know such a, a a brilliant and generous idea could you just tell a bit tell us a bit about how sort of how you came up with that and and what your um what your goal is in doing it yeah it's um yeah, I mean, it's just been such a crazy year. Um, and, yeah, I, I've made made my living for, for, for a good part of time as, as a live musician myself, and I've slowly sort of phased that out to do more studio-based stuff. So, yeah, a lot of my friends are, are touring musicians. That, that's their living. Um, my, my circle of friends is, is sort of based around the mu music and arts sort of world. And yet, I mean, e even though I don't rely on, on uh, playing live for my, for my living, it, just not being able to go to gigs and, and play the odd gig has, has been, yeah, re really tough. So, yeah, so I just, I just thought I'd try and do my, like a, a really small part to, to, to help out, you know, I've got a family who work in the NHS and I just think, um, yeah, it, people are, are just working so hard to help other people um, at the minute. If I can just do like a small thing, it helps out, you know, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, so what's, so the, yeah, what's the deal with it? What? How does it work? Yeah, so I just thought I'd, I'd just put one day aside where I basically I just work for free for every Monday. I just uh, offer mastering of one track for free for anyone that gets in touch. And uh, yeah, just send me a track and I'll, I'll master it and send it back. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm here to work for, for anyone who sends a track in. Um, yeah, the, I guess the idea was to help musicians that have been at home, haven't been able to tour. They might have been able to record a single or some stuff. And then if I can master it and get it get it sounding really good, they can then upload it and sell it to their fans or get it played on the radio or at least get some sort of either financial or just or, or sort of creative... Um, uh, reward from it it's such a an incredibly generous thing i mean I, I i've experienced it myself that you know just how how lovely the community of musicians are um you know instagram seems to be the important tool for us in you know in terms of uh sort of peddling our wares uh, if you like um but everybody He's so generous. I mean, I've been on the receiving end of lots of generosity on Instagram and tried to give it. You know, it's a, it's. A, yeah. I think. Um, I think it can be, for songwriters who are uh, uh, writing on their own now a lot. I mean, even outside of COVID, people were were you know they're getting home setups and all that kind of stuff. It can yeah. feel like an intimidating industry to approach. You know, who do you go for for mastering? Who do you? you know and how is it really expensive and it's just a big minefield of of places and you know the same could be said for remote working uh, for remote instrument playing like you know like what i do yeah and i think the more generous you can be the the better really you know we're not we're essentially we do what we do because we love it not because we want to make a million pounds out of it <laughs> you know yeah yeah um yeah and, it, and it's been amazing i've had some really People who've got in touch who, who, like you say, haven't 
had anything mastered before, have been a bit sort of bamboozled by the whole thing. And um, yeah, I've been able to just e explain stuff and and, uh, and and help people out a little bit. And people have been just, yeah, really grateful. And yeah, it, it's just been, I think it's been great to just, to, you know, it, it can, it doesn't take me that long. And even if I spend one day a week doing it, it gets, you know, it has such a, a big knock on effect for people, I think. It's brilliant. I mean, I'll put details on, um, on how to get in touch with you and things on, on the sort of notes for this. Um, oh, Cause I think hopefully it's a service that a lot of people listening to this can sort of take advantage of i mean <laughs> your rates are extremely reasonable anyway so <laughs> um, but they uh you know i think um i think your uh what you're doing uh is perfect in terms of the sound for um for the sort of music that people who are listening to this will be interested in. i mean i know you just finished working on um joe kane uh who i've interviewed for this podcast as well um and i think i'll I'll have to interview him again. I haven't got any choice because he's just got the, made this incredible Beatlesy album and using yeah. loads of uh, beautiful analog gear at his studio. And I'm, I, I mean, I'm just going to have to get him back in to talk about it all. But you've just finished yeah. working on that, and that's proper sort of Beatles pastiche, um, early early sixties, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, yeah. He's phenomenal. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I just can't. Yeah, you can't really describe how just how well he's got everything down and <laughs> how good he gets it. Um, yeah, you just have to go listen to it. It's uh, but the yeah. fact that um, as soon as uh, as soon as he found out about you and the sort of um, curve bender you've got and the fair change you've got, <laughs> it was like, well, it's perfect. I have I have yeah. no choice but to have it mastered by um, by Ben. It's just, um, it was, and he, in fact, he messaged me two days ago with a little sound clip of something that you've just worked on for him. And, uh, oh, cool, yeah. yeah, it sounded amazing. You've just done such a, a superb job, um, really sympathetically enhancing what he's doing. Cause you have to be really careful with that sort of, um, pastiche type stuff. You, you, you know, it can, it can go wrong quite quickly and the job you've done making it sound the way it sounds is amazing it sounds brilliant oh great yeah well, i'm glad yeah it's uh yeah it's been yeah amazing to work on it's such yeah great tunes and uh yeah just love yeah just love running it through all all this gear and uh, do you have yeah. um do you have a sort of favorite style that you like working on or a, a, a favorite um Maybe not a genre, but is you know, say having a full sort of rock band setup or uh, acoustic guitar and vocal. Do you have any sort of a particular favourite thing that you like working on? Um, I, th I think the beauty of of mastering is like the variety. I think if I worked on any one thing all day every day, I'd probably tire of it pretty soon. But the fact I can master a, a folk. EP in the morning and then get a, a death metal track in, in the afternoon and then do a hip hop compilation the next day. It, it's just brilliant. It, you know, I think that that's what I really love. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's music I like to play and that I might listen to at home, but but for mastering, yeah, the variety is is great. Cool. Uh, a bit, a bit of, bit, a bit of everything, sort of non-answer there, but yeah. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so anything. Oh, I was just going to say anything more sort of dynamic uh, works great with with my yeah. So yeah. stuff, stuff like stuff that's been recorded with live, live instruments, live vocals, even, um, just re really fits well. I, I still do master dance dance stuff like that occasionally, um, but but my gear works great with with like lively music, you know. Yeah, I can see that. You know, like as we've sort of discussed, you've got a, a good balance between creative tools and and sort of a uh, tools just for tools' sake, you know, tools to do a job. And and I think um, you know, the more creativity you've got. 
the more room for creativity you have in the music that that sort of lets lets your um not uh, not only your gear but sort of the decisions that you make um more interesting um yeah sure what um what would you do you get, have any say you know singer songwriter is is at home working on a mix of a song now to send to you do you have any particular hmm. mistakes that you see routinely or things that you've got to fix in the master um that you that you think are worth pointing out to people who might be preparing mixes for mastering um yeah i don't think there's any sort of one problem that that occurs all the time i, I guess the main thing is mixes coming in really loud and already already sort of limited or or head compressed um because then that sort of limits what i can do on my end so i guess yeah the main advice i give to uh, to anyone who sends me stuff is is, is, is don't is don't don't put a limiter on your on your master bus and and just just mix it at a, a nice level don't push it because the, the more dynamic it is at, at that stage ironically the louder i can make it at my mm. end if you if you want a loud master um so yeah so i think just yeah pe people like things loud it's sort of quite <laughs> natural for us to to gain and volumes just creep up uh you know so well humans, yeah, just leave it's things. the human thing isn't it louder is better <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah so yeah but but yeah but things just sound so much better when it's nice and dynamic and nice and open what um as a in the sort of a entrepreneurial mindset again I, i'd loathe to use that word but you know that kind of we've all musicians have all got that spirit inside them um yeah you know as somebody who's gone from sort of a the germination of an idea of like oh i'd like to be you know i'd like to do have a mastering studio to suddenly having this you know incredibly well kitted out studio and you're sort of you know you're living the dream essentially you're doing a job that you absolutely love with some incredible gear that you're really good at and um what advice would you give to anybody who is working at at home or perhaps listeners who want to get involved in the audio industry and and you know what's your experience of the industry at the moment and how would you advise going about sort of taking next steps for people yeah it's a tough one i, th I think it's it's not it's not like getting a job where you apply for a job and then if you get it you start you have a start date and then you're starting to do that job and then you do it because it i i've been doing this since i was i guess i started at college at 16 i'm 39 now and and it's been quite gradual for me to get where i am now and um big part i think of why i can do this full time is because i've spent 20 years around musicians being a sound engineer a live musician and i guess spending 20 years practicing building contacts and all that sort of stuff um and even this studio has has sort of taken me 10 years to to really build up to where it is now um so yeah i think it takes takes a long time i think just you just have to keep doing what you love doing and um if you have a goal in mind that's great and the, i mean this for me formulated over quite a long period of time so so which is, there's no really good advice there apart well from, i think it's patience is the word that springs to mind and yeah you know yeah. The, the sort of the way that the world is it uh it's a i think there's a meme that i've discussed on the podcast before of like a i think you'll have seen it like it's those four squares and someone you know gets their first um gets their first interface and like opens garage band and suddenly they're a mix engineer and yeah it's that thing and the reality is that it takes an awful long time to do it. And, um, you know, even just working in music in general, it took me 10 years 
to get to the point where I didn't lose sleep over where my money was coming from. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, yeah. and that, that took, it, yeah, it took 10 years of doing it. And I think uh, a lot of, yeah, I'm not suggesting for any second that anyone listening to this is, is, is like it, but a lot of people will expect that things happen quite quickly and, yeah. and want, you know, we live in an immediacy, a culture with immediacy now, don't we? And, and um, you know, that I think often, often people don't appreciate how much work has gone into it. You know, the, the sort of backstory behind your studio and, and how you've got to do it and why, um, sort of why they should entrust you to, to master their songs, essentially, you know, I, I'm putting, I'm putting the words out there. I know you can't, you can't say people should trust you to master their songs necessarily, but, um, you know, there's, there's a reason why you're doing it and you're really good at it and it's taken you a long time to get there. And that's, uh, you know, I think, I think it's easy to overlook that. Yeah. Um, particularly when people are making the decision to spend money on, on things that, you know, as we've sort of spoken about earlier, that, that plugins could do. They go, well, why would I, you know, why would I pay someone X amount of money to master it when I can have a plugin that can just do a kind, a, a job, a kind of job. <laughs> um, yeah. And yeah. the reality is they're not going to, it, it's not the same. There is a vast difference, you know, a, a cavernous yeah. difference between what a plugin can do and what you can achieve at your place. Um, and through, through all of that experience that you've built up, you know? Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's yeah like say yeah patience and and a lot of time um which is i guess yeah i'm i'm here now because 10 years ago i started mastering records that we'd recorded in a living room <laughs> and, and i i was curious and and really eager to learn at every stage and you know some of those records that we first did back then we managed to get played on like six music and radio, radio and stuff like that. Um, you know, I'm not putting any of that down to my mastering skills. <laughs> but um, yeah, but it was, um, yeah, I think just the fact we were doing it all the time. and We weren't really doing it for a, like a, a financial thing. You know, it wasn't a business idea or anything. It was, we just loved doing it. So we, recorded and mixed and mastered all the time so i guess yeah that that's the advice if, if you want to get into it just just to do it all the time and yeah, yeah. as much as you can and and, and it'll unfold o over time yeah i like that way of thinking about it it unfolds Isn't slowly it? over time i think that's a nice way where can people find more information about um rare tone mastering and, and what you're yeah, so the website is raretonemastering.com um, and then there's uh, probably the best thing to do if you're on social media is to follow my Instagram. Uh, I'm, I'm not great at all social media, but I do use Instagram. So Your game has upped significantly over the past few months. You don't, I, I don't think you need to be, don't be too hard on yourself. I, oh. I love your social media. <laughs> oh, well, that's great. I'm glad, yeah, I'm glad to, uh, yeah, I'm glad you've noticed. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I am making a real effort to actually be on there and engage with people. Um, and a lot of people are getting in touch about the free mastering Mondays. So I, I try to be on there so I can reply and send people to the website to, to, uh, to do that. Um, so, um, so yeah, Instagram or, or the website, raretonemastering.com forward slash free is the, um, free mastering Mondays page. So cool. I'll link, I'll link it all down to all of that stuff. And I'm hoping that, uh, you know, we've already discussed that by the time this, episode is out so i'll split i split these episodes into two halves yeah. um anyone who's on my isolated drums mailing list um ben has kindly offered to master um some of my drum tracks um to send out to you guys so we are um i am going to have a think about what i think would be the best ones to to run through your beautiful gear <laughs> and have your yeah. your midas touch put on them <laughs> um, and then for uh for a whole month i'll send out um i mean 
absolutely ridiculously incredibly good sounding drums <laughs> i hope <laughs> uh, yeah i can't wait to yeah to get the drums through uh through this uh unfair child that's yeah can't wait to do that i'm thinking i mean uh, people should perhaps get in touch and, and let me know I, it'll be too late by this point but <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, might yeah. put, I might put it out on instagram and ask people to get in touch but i need to think of some what's going to benefit the most you know i'm thinking maybe something off the off Revolver, um, something off Sergeant Peppers, and then maybe something off White Album and Abbey Road might be quite cool. Yeah. So we get a good mix of, of, of things. Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, I need to get my thinking cap on and and um, and uh, decide what I want. <laughs> yeah, please do. Yeah, be yeah, great fun doing those. Amazing. Well, thanks so much for taking such a, a a huge chunk of your day to talk to me. I really appreciate it. Oh, pleasure. Yeah, it's been great. are aware that I record isolated drum stems and um, so exact transcriptions of Ringo's part on different Beatles songs and Ben has offered to run some of my stems through his uh, Chandler EQ and the Fairchild and he's got a, a tape emulation hard piece of hardware that he uses uh, that's that it sounds fantastic and that's what you were listening to so it was with a little help was the first sort of seg um, beat and that one was I Want You, She's So Heavy and they're all tracks that I will be sending out to my mailing list in the next few weeks that have been run through Ben's gear so if you want um, to, to get those and you're not already on the mailing list it's allyouneediesdrums.com and just sign up there and it's all completely free then uh, the one I'm going to send out uh, tomorrow is Dear Prudence and we've also done I'm trying to think which one it is now oh, back in the USSR so I Want You, She's So Heavy, uh, with a little help from my friends, back in the USSR and Dear Prudence. And I'm going to start with Dear Prudence tomorrow at homemastering.com. I'll put all the links to it in the show notes. Okay, so the next episode in two weeks' time is with John Kurlander and Scott, Malcolm Toft and John Kurlander, who all started at 16 at Abbey Road and all learnt from each other. So John Kurlander is perhaps the last of that list of people. And he is a now a, a very well-known mix engineer. He spent 30-odd years at Abbey Road doing all kinds of uh, different sessions. And he has mixed the Lord of the Rings soundtracks and done some amazingly diverse things. Sort of, so all manner of pop recordings, uh, right through to sort of big classical things, which I'm not that uh, familiar with. Obviously, the film scores I'm familiar with. Um, but sort of classical artists I'm not that familiar with, but I still find it absolutely fascinating that he had a career so diverse. So next couple of episodes will be with John Kurlander, and they are amazing. I was so excited to share this interview with you. It's potentially one of my favourite interviews I've ever done. And uh, apologies to everybody I've interviewed, you're all my favourites, but I particularly enjoyed this interview, so I can't wait for that to come out. Uh, so that'll be there in two weeks' time. Uh, as usual, if you'd like to get in contact with me, you can do that. My email address is joe at allyouneediesdrums.com. You can visit allyouneediesdrums.com, my website, or I'm on Instagram. Uh, I'll put links to all Ben's stuff in the show notes. And that just leaves me to say a big thank you to my friend Joe Kane for the amazing intro and outro music he supplied for this podcast and my good friend David Henshaw for the artwork he lovingly supplies to me every two weeks. Uh, so have a fantastic fortnight and I will speak to you all soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.